Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the evangelists, wrote the four Gospels. None of them identify themselves as the writer. It doesn't say the Gospel according to Matthew. Matthew never says that in Matthew. But uh, those authors have been handed down to us since the first century AD. Uh, nobody has argued with their authorship. They felt it was a, just a little bold to say, well, here I am, the, the guy who is uh, taking, you know, it, it just it sounded proud. It sounded like a work uh, of vanity to them to take credit as they wrote the story of Jesus Christ. John refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And uh, that doesn't mean that he means, well, Jesus loved me more than the rest of us. And we tend to think that because he leaned on his breast at the Lord's Supper. And, but the reason why he said that is, is to just say, I'm nobody. Jesus loves everybody, man. You know, and so I'm, I'm nobody. But he wanted you to know that he is an eyewitness in the things he saw, he saw and he didn't hear it from somebody else. Matthew was one of the disciples of Jesus as well, one of the 12. Mark was the uh, nephew of Barnabas, who uh, went on Paul's first, went, went with Paul on the first missionary journey to the Gentiles. His mother uh, was related to Jesus and li they lived in Jerusalem and she in fact, uh, if our history uh, is correct, uh, owned the, the home in which the upper room was. And so Mark was connected too. And uh, he was later, later on uh, associated with, with uh, after traveling with Barnabas and Paul the first trip, later on he was associated with Peter. So a lot of people consider his gospel a brief account of Peter's memoirs. Um, Luke wasn't an eyewitness to the life of Jesus, but he did interviews and research during the time that Jesus, that Paul was imprisoned in uh, Caesarea. Luke had opportunity for a couple of years to travel around, and he's the one. Of the, he's the one who has the. Uh, accounts that other people don't have about the, the birth. I want to, I guess I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here anyway, but he wasn't an eyewitness to the, to the life of Jesus, but he made interviews, he did research, and, uh, and that's what he says as his reason. I, a lot of people have taken a hand to write about this, but I have taken the time to find out about it and uh, interview the proper people, and I'm writing this account. The man Luke was a physician, friend, missionary companion of the Apostle Paul. Colossians 4.14 mentions him, uh, the beloved physician. Oh, I, I have half that uh, verse missing, I'm sorry. Luke, the beloved physician, and Damas greet you. And uh, to the Colossians he's writing, in Philemon, the 23rd verse, he says, Epaphras, this is a Paul writing in all three of these uh, places. I have the scriptures written there, Colossians, Philemon, and 2 Timothy. In Philemon, he says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Damas, Luke, my fellow laborers. In 2 Timothy, chapter 4, 11, this was the last writing of the Apostle Paul shortly before he was martyred. And uh, it's, it's really precious. When, when you know that in your heart and mind and you read 2 Timothy, it gives it a whole new flavor. It's something to think about and maybe uh, look into. In verse chapter 4, verse 11, only Luke is with me. Uh, he had said earlier, Damas hath forsaken me, and, and everybody is, everybody's afraid. Paul is going to be uh, executed for his faith in Jesus. And most of the disciples, even though they love Jesus and they love Paul, uh, they have an opportunity to get out, and it's, there's nothing wrong with saving your life to preach another day. But he said, the only one who stuck with me is Luke. 
So, and he's telling Timothy, get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for this ministry. So, these are the references in the Bible to Luke, aside from the gospel that he wrote. Like I said, he was a, a physician, as Paul uh, mentioned in Colossians chapter 4, a doctor. His language in the book of Luke shows that he was an educated man. And his language shows that he's the kind of man that uh, very well could be a physician. You know, he had, he had the education as indicated by his vocabulary and such. Uh, and uh, the companion with the Apostle Paul and an eyewitness to a lot of the events in the book of Acts. He didn't witness the life of Jesus Christ. But in the second missionary journey of Paul, he visited the churches that he and Barnabas had planted the first time around. And then he headed out to cross Asia. They called it, that was the name of the Roman province at the time, it's modern day Turkey. And they, he headed out across Asia which is why we call it Asia Minor, from still from those days. Anyway, and uh, when he got across to right around where Istanbul is today, when we he reached the sea again, uh, there's a city called Troas. And that's where he picked up Luke. Uh, in Acts chapter 16, verse 8, uh, Luke is telling the story here now. And he said, So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. You'll remember, uh, perhaps, on this trip, Paul wanted to go to Ephesus. And he, you know, he, he, his first desire was to go to Ephesus, but the Holy Spirit forbade him. And then he desired to, desired to go to Bithynia. Ephesus was southeast from where he was at. Bithynia was north. And so he wanted to go southeast. To, Ephesus was the major city of the whole province. One of the largest cities in the Roman Empire. So it made sense. Go to the big city if you want the gospel. You preach the gospel in a little town, uh, it stays there. You preach the gospel in a big city, Everybody from the small towns have to come to the city for this and that you know, over a period of time, and the gospel spreads out. Anyway, and that was Paul's philosophy, and it's a good one. But uh, the Holy Spirit said, no, you're not going to Ephesus. You're not going to Bithynia. And so he said, well, there's only one more direction. So he had it just straight west, and, and he got to uh, the Aegean Sea there between Turkey and Greece. Were on, and the seaport there was Troas. And uh, so he came down to Troas and he had a vision in the night of the man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Uh, Macedonia was to the northwest of Troas. You'd cover just a short little corner of the sea and get into modern day uh, what is that? Modern, it's, uh, I'm Yugoslavia? trying to remember the names of those countries nowadays. It had been uh, Bulgaria and, uh, and Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia. Not, you, Czechoslovakia is a bit north, but anyway, I wish I had my map. I'd flip it up there. I mean, one of these days I'm going to be organized. I apologized last week, and, and uh, anyway, I've been fighting some... Uh, we can look in our book, Bibles yeah. and anyway, find the map. Anyway, so you, you probably have a map in the back. In any case, he, the Lord told him to go to Macedonia. But at that point, it says in verse 10 of Acts 16, And after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia. And that's the first personal pronoun that's used in the book of Acts. Up until now, for the first 16 chapters, first 15 chapters, Luke is saying they did this and Paul did that and Peter did this and the Jerusalem church did that. All of a sudden in Acts 16, 8, he says, and we decided to go to Macedonia. So Luke joined them at that point. 
and he traveled with the Apostle Paul for much of his remaining ministry. Um, he's the only Gentile author of scripture. All the other uh, writers of scripture were Jewish men. And um, of course in the New Testament the Gospels open to uh, Gentiles as well. But the only one that wrote a, a, Bible, a book of the Bible is Luke. We learn that he's a Gentile because it says in Colossians 4 again, verse 11, he's, Paul is talking, he says, Aristarchus and Mark are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. Luke, the beloved physician, and Damas greet you. So there's four of us over here. We got Aristarchus, Mark, Luke, and Damas. And um, only Aristarchus and Mark are Jews. <laughs> so anyway, and so that's how we learn that Luke was in fact a Gentile. The first four verses, inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us. And he, he begins to speak. Um, this, these four verses are considered some of the best Greek in the entire New Testament. Better than Matthew, Mark, John, Paul. Um, Paul was bilingual. He spoke, from childhood, he spoke both Greek and uh, Hebrew. But uh, Matthew and, and Mark and John, they, they, were, uh, they were Jewish men, and they learned Greek later in life. And so, and, and Mark, by the way, is, is very simple, very straightforward. It's not, a, it's not a very, you can tell he's not a learned man by his Greek. And just very, you know, like I speak Hindi, I speak, I, I don't speak it as well as I used to, but I can speak Hindi and I can get by and I can talk to people and I read Hindi and, you know, I, I can work my, I can see my way around. But uh, if I was to write literature, it would show that I have Hindi as a second language. And, uh, and Matthew was more educated than Mark, as was John. And of course, John wrote much later in life after he'd lived among the Gentiles for decades. And so his is, his is well written, but Luke is by far and away the best of the writers in the Greek. Except, I don't know if you're interested in this, it, it fascinates me, but uh, the book of Hebrews, nobody knows who wrote the book of Hebrews. And uh, the, the Greek in Hebrews is equal and possibly even better than the Greek in Luke. So anyway, and uh, yes, I do know the Greek alphabet and I know a lot of Greek words, but uh, I, and I have a Greek Bible and I have sat down and puzzled my way through it. But I do not habitually do my devotions in Greek, <laughs> okay. Anyway, so this is some of the best Greek. And the collections, uh, some of the most, probably the most thorough collection of the Jesus stories, because Luke did research and found all the various things. Uh, most scholars believe that Luke used Mark as a starting point. He used Mark as a basic outline, and then he went from there. There was also a document and, that they've called Q, and it's, uh, I don't understand Q completely. It was just a collection of the stories, the, the works and teachings of Jesus. And it was in circulation, and there was more, there was some editions that were more thorough, that had more stories than others, but uh, all, of the, all of the ancient, uh, the biblical ancient study scholars um, 
believed that there was a, a mother load, as it were, of stories of Jesus. They, and they've named it Q for lack of anything else. In addition to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's a lot of other fragments of life of Jesus by different people. Some of them were written a couple of hundred years later. You might have heard of the Gospel of Thomas. It's very popular because the New Age people have bought, have you know, uh, promoted it and everything because it is contrary to Scripture. It teaches a different philosophy, basically a different religion than uh, the Bible. And uh, it was written by the Gnostics, which was the first cult in the Christian church. They came up late in the first century, uh, and they, and of course the teachings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John contradicted the teachings of the Gnostics. Uh, the Gnostics kind of tried to wed Greek philosophy with the biblical scriptures. And, uh, and there, I could give a lot of examples, but basically it would, they tried to put the two together and where the Hebrew you know, uh, worldview conflicted with the Greek worldview, they somehow twisted it to make it look like, well, Jesus thought like a Greek. And anyway, and they were, they were called the Gnostics. And uh, they, they've, uh, you'll see in the scripture a couple of times, if anybody says that Jesus is not born in the flesh, he's a heretic, he's a bad guy. And that was one of the teachings of the Gnostics. They believed that uh, spirit is good and flesh is bad. Okay, and so they, they believed that God is good and he is spirit, but he could never become flesh as Jesus did because spirit is good and flesh is bad. And in Philippians, Paul even mentions, hey, your body is good, take care of it, and, do, you know, and, and he talks about it. And again, it's a, a little, little sideways uh, slam on the Gnostics. So anyway, uh, that's what the Gospel of Thomas, it has its roots in Gnosticism. They took the stories of Jesus and added their own stories. They have Jesus doing miracles as a child and taking clay pigeons and throwing them up in the air and they turn into real pigeons and all his buddies are impressed and things like that. But uh, of course it's heresy. All, all that to say that uh, there was a lot of different stories about Jesus going around but ultimately in around 300 AD when the Council of uh, uh, Nicaea got together they decided on the real scriptures written by who they say they're written by were Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke wanted to be the documented gospel. He wanted to not, he didn't have memoirs of his own to write. And so uh, he did interviews, we're assuming, because that's what he said. I have I've examined this, and I, and I want to write an orderly account, having had perfect understanding from the very first. Where did he get that? During the time that uh, Paul was imprisoned in Caesarea, Luke went around Judea and Galilee and interviewed people who were eyewitnesses. He's the only one that has the story of the birth of Jesus. Matthew talks about it, but Luke has the whole uh, manger and Bethlehem and, and everything. That's because he talked to Mary. And she was still alive at the time. We're talking late 50s AD. So uh, Mary was a teenager when Jesus was born. She'd be in her, she'd be late 50s, you know. And so he could easily have talked to Mary and a lot of other eyewitnesses. It's not a biography. When you look at the life of Jesus, you have what they call the, the silent years. From the, from the age of two, when he, uh, Joseph took his little family to Egypt, and then, fight, and then came back when Herod died in 4 BC, uh, until the age of 30, there's 
only one incident recorded in the Bible. Now, if Luke was doing a biography, he would have put all the other, well, what, what, did Je what was Jesus like when he was a kid? And, and was he a good boy? And, well, we know he was a good boy, he was sinless. But he didn't put it in that, and neither did Matthew and Mark and, and John, because this isn't a biography, this is the gospel. And his life before being filled with the Spirit was irrelevant to the gospel. You ever wonder about that? Because they're not doing a biography, that wasn't the point. Uh, and you can get confused with a lot of information, and, and like I said, the Gnostics did write about his childhood, but it was made up. So, like I said, during Paul's imprisonment, Luke conducted interviews. He learned Mary's side of the story. He learned the details of visitations to Zacharias. Zacharias and Elizabeth, of course, uh, they had died by now, but he, he got the the very the songs and everything given by Mary and the Holy Spirit, I'm sure quickening her memory to remember word for word the prophetic utterances that uh, they gave. And like I said, the manger in Bethlehem, all this um, is from the mouth of Mary. He addresses it to Theophilus, which means lover of God. Theos is God, phileo is love. <coughs> we sometimes say brotherly love to uh, contrast it with agape love. But uh, brotherly love or phileo is uh, human love. I love my family, I love my wife. It's, it is, you know, a love of the emotions. It's human love. Mind and emotions, of course. We, we all know what love is. Uh, agape is not like a super <coughs> duper emotional love. It's more a love of the will. It's a love that I am committed to Jesus Christ no matter what. I may fall out of love with my childhood sweetheart, but I will never fall out of agape with Jesus. We're committed. This is a, this is serious and uh, less emotional than a, a love of the will, which is not our subject today. But I'm talking about this man's name, uh, the lover of God. Uh, he was probably the patron who sponsored Luke in the writing of this book hmm. because it costs money like it does today and to set aside your time and everything and to have the materials and everything he was a, a writer's head patrons and uh, according to the mentions that uh, Luke makes of him in the book of Acts and the book of Luke Acts is chapter is part two of the book of Luke. They're meant to be read together. Volume one and two of the same publication as it were. And both of them are addressed to, uh, both of them are written by Luke and addressed to Theophilus. And uh, so he, he very well could have been a young believer in need of further instruction and uh, a well-to-do person that could uh, I'll pay you if you if you put this together and do it right. I'll, I'll cover the cost, no problems. You know. And so Luke said, "Yeah, I, I can I can handle that." Mm -hmm. And of course, with a name like Theophilus, it's perfect. It's it's written to lovers of God everywhere. The date of Luke and Acts would have to be. before Paul's release from his first Roman imprisonment because that's where the book of Acts stops. Paul is arrested or Paul uh, is arrested in Judea and he's shipped all the way to Rome if you remember the story in the book of Acts and, and he finally gets to Rome and he's under house arrest in Rome awaiting trial and that's where the book of Acts ends. He hadn't yet gone to trial I'll tell you, do, how many know what happened when he went to trial? He was released. 
he was released, and uh, some people believe that he actually made it to Spain as he always desired to. We do know that he made it back to Crete, where he left Titus, and to uh, uh, went through Troas and some of those areas again, and back to Ephesus again too. And he was traveling after that, he, he traveled again over to Corinth and uh, was arrested uh, west of Greek, Greece on a, the other side, I know, the sea that's between Greece and Italy. The, uh, anyway, he was arrested along there and uh, taken to Rome. And this time they didn't release him, he was executed. But uh, the date then would put the book of, uh, the book of Acts had to be completed somewhere between 60 to 63 AD. So the book of Luke would be late 50s. Adriatic Sea. Adriatic. And the other one is the Aegean Sea on the other side, right? Mm -hmm. On the other side it. of Greece. Uh. It is. Okay. Any questions so far? Major themes in the book of Acts. Number one, it's the dawn of a new era, the New Testament. All the promises of the Old Testament, and Matthew especially hits the Old Testament fulfillment, but uh, Luke does too, and uh, it's the number one uh, reason for the Gospels is to say Jesus is the answer to all the messianic expectations of the Old Testament. I was reading in the uh, Jewish a, a commentary from a Jewish perspective of the New Testament and by a, by a uh, Christian Jew and uh, he said that they began to because of Jesus that the, eventually the Jewish people began to reinterpret the Old Testament prophecies like Isaiah chapter 9 unto us a son is born a child is given and his name shall be called wonderful counselor Mighty God, um, the Everlasting Father, it's a Prince of Peace. And uh, they changed that whole thing. Instead of unto us a child is born, they, they changed their interpretation of that too. And the characteristics of God is that he is wonderful, counselor, mighty God. And because they were rejecting Jesus Christ. And of course this happened much later, much later. But uh, the Gospels are written basically to say Jesus is the fulfillment that the Jew, of what the Jews have been looking forward to all this time. His life, his death, fulfilled prophecies. It confused his disciples and, and it would confuse the, the Jewish leaders looking by saying, well, we, we just killed this guy. How could he be the Messiah? That was in the Bible, wasn't it? Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, elsewhere, prophesied and, and, and anyway, so that's the Gospels and Luke uh, were definitely written to share, share that Jesus is the introducer of, the, the, of a new covenant, a new age, a new era. The Old Testament is fulfilled in him. Relationship with God and forgiveness of sins now offered to all people. Number two, he emphasizes more than anybody else the age of the Holy Spirit. In fact, all five of these points that I have there are, are Luke just, they're all, they're all spoken of by the other guys, but not to the emphasis of Luke. 
The New Testament is the age of the Holy Spirit. Joel chapter 2, he looked forward to the Holy Spirit coming and being available to everybody, not just an occasional anointing here and there, like it says in Hebrews um, chapter 1 and verse 1, in old times God moved in diverse ways here and there. And, but no, in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is available to everybody. I will pour out my flesh and my spirit upon all flesh. And uh, so Luke really emphasizes in both Luke and Acts, the, it's the age of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's been silent for 400 years. And all of a sudden, the first chapters of Luke, we've got all these people prophesying. Zechariah and Mary and Elizabeth and Simeon and everybody's getting all excited and prophesying. I actually, I'm not sure if Zechariah did. I, I don't know, but we'll look at it in a second. But, uh, and Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit to accomplish the task of being the Messiah and fulfilling the scriptures. And then in the book of Acts, the Spirit of God is pulled up, poured out on everybody, all believers, in fulfillment of Joel chapter 2, which enables the spread of the gospel. Jesus was able to do what he did by the power of the Holy Spirit. I've underlined and emphasized this so many times in sermons that Philippians 2, he emptied himself when he left heaven, but when the baptism of the Holy Spirit came upon him, that's when he began to do miracles and such. And then in the book of Acts, we all, all believers can get the baptism in the Holy Spirit and begin to operate in that same power. I've always been frustrated because he said we'd do even greater works and I'd be happy to do half the works. <laughs> We need to get a hold of some of these things. <laughs> Can you say amen? <laughs> really? <clears throat> Number three, the gospel is for all nations. Messiah is not just the Jewish Messiah. He's the Messiah for everyone. Messiah, as most of you know, means the anointed one. The anointed one. He's the one that has the Holy Spirit. Praise God. And in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would fall upon a, a man of God and he'd do mighty works and, and then the Holy Spirit would seemingly lift off of him. There's only two people in the Old Testament, I think Joseph and Daniel, that the, they said they, the Holy Spirit abided with them. In, you know, and I don't know if it was constant or more often than ever, the other heroes or what, but uh, they didn't have an abiding anointing of the Holy Spirit like we do. And so that's why you see Samson doing these supernatural works of strength that you couldn't, it wasn't because he had big biceps. You, you, that's what, what's the secret of your strength? You look like everybody else, but it was the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But then he'd, the Spirit would lift off of him and he'd sin and, and blow it. That's another lesson that I haven't figured out completely yet. But anyway, <laughs> so the it's the age of the Holy Spirit. And number three, the gospel is for everybody. The Messiah is for everybody. Not just the Jews. This was in the Old Testament. But it was largely ignored by the majority of the Jewish people. They, did, they, they viewed the Gentiles as the nations, they're, they're the bad guys. And, and, and they had every reason to uh, view them as enemies because the Gentiles always were afflicting them. And not all the Gentiles, of course, but the, the powerful ones. Because, and they, well, they were afflicting everybody. But they're looking for the, the, the Savior to come and save them from the, the bad guys. And uh, Jesus said the gospel is for everybody, even the bad guys. The Messiah is for everyone. And this especially comes to fruition in the book of Acts, where the, uh, they bring the 
gospel of Jesus Christ outside of the Jewish community. First Peter at the house of Cornelius and then Paul and Barnabas and it, it went from there. Number four, the gospel is for outcasts. Jesus said, uh, John asked, is, are you he that's to come? And the first thing Jesus said, look, the gospel is preached to the poor. The poor, not the rich, not the, the powerful, the poor. And Luke uh, includes the story of the good Samaritan. Samaritans, prostitutes. He, he, had not, he, he fellowships with tax collectors and prostitutes. And again, Luke emphasizes that more than the rest. He said, Jesus is for the outcasts of society. <laughs> the tax collectors, they're the Roman collaborators. How do you think the French you know, felt about the German collaborators that turned in other Frenchmen to not the Nazis? You know, that's what the tax collectors were doing. They were taking money from their fellow Jewish people and giving it to the Romans but also charging a little extra for themselves. And they were all prospering. They were collaborators with the enemy. And, but Jesus died for tax collectors too. And Samaritans too were the arch enemies of the Jewish people. It's, so the, the gospel is for outcasts. And number five, the gospel is for women as well as men. I've shared many times you know, that when Becky and I first read the Bible, we read the Old Testament, we're saying, gee, God doesn't seem to like ladies much. And now I, I, I don't see that at all. But looking at it as new believers and, and just, hmm, you know, God does see a difference between men and women. He made them male and female. <laughs> Amen. He decided this. But one isn't greater than the other. And so the gospel is for women as well as men. It's Luke who portrays women in prominent roles in the birth story. It, the ladies are holding the center stage, aren't they? Elizabeth and Mary and everything. <clears throat> And then, who were the financial supporters of Jesus? And it names a handful of women, including Mary Magdalene, that uh, uh, supported Jesus financially. And uh, Mary of Bethany, who may or may not have been Mary of, uh, of Magdala as well, uh, was sitting at the feet of Jesus when he's teaching in the disciples' posture. Martha wasn't just angry that she wasn't helping in the kitchen. She's saying she's really out of place culturally here too. You don't have lady disciples. Rabbis don't have lady disciples. Jesus did. Jesus did. And Luke is the one who points this out more than anybody else. Women have full participation in the gospel full participation in the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. Any questions? I'm done with the introductory stuff. We're going to actually read the Bible here now for a while. But it's important we get that. Because we have respect for Luke before we even start reading him. preview of what to expect. Verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. 
The priests were required, by the way, to also marry a Levite. And, a, and, and, a, a pre, and also the active priests were, were required to marry not just a Levite, but a descendant of uh, Aaron himself. So both of these are descendants, not just of Levi, but of Aaron, the original high priest. And she was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both well advanced in years. So it was that while he was serving as a priest before God in the order of his division, there were 24 divisions of priests. It's laid out in the law, which meant that each of the divisions would serve in the temple for two weeks of the year. And they'd scatter those weeks so it would, you know, Zechariah's division would be um, one week and then somewhere down the road, probably half a year later, he would get another week. And by, you know, there was just a lot of Levites by then, a lot of priests, a lot of children of uh, Aaron. So while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And you got all these priests, and who gets to do what in the you know, and, and he gets to enter to, into the, the uh, holy place, into the sanctuary, <coughs> where not the holy of holies, the, the high priest enters once a year there, but the holy place has the altar of incense and the table of showbread, and uh, the candlestick, the candlestick, okay which we have little menorahs all over the place. I have one in my office, matter of fact. Anyway, which is essentially a, a model of the candlestick that was in the sanctuary. <laughs> all right. And his lot fell to burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. It was down to an elaborate ritual by this time. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, for many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. Here we are, after 400 years of Holy Spirit silence, he's going to baptize a baby in the womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit of, and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So we'll, we'll stop there. Uh, the birth of John the Baptist is foretold. The angel appears and Gabriel, by the way, there's two angels named in the Bible, Gabriel and Michael. And uh, Gabriel is named as a messenger. He, he stands in the presence of God and, and takes messages to humans. And among whatever his other duties are, we know that he's the one that usually brings a message uh, in the Bible anyway. And he brings a message about the birth of John who will be the forerunner of the Messiah. Uh, this goes back to Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 and 4. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Uh, Isaiah 40 starts out with, Comfort ye my people, comfort my people. 
I'm bringing something that's going to be really good and be and and uh, and he goes on to say the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. And that's the, when John came on the scene, people said, are you the Messiah? Are you him? Are, are you, wow, are you going to forgive us our sins? And then, well, he's baptizing them for the remission of their sins. He says, no, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. One comes after me that I'm not even uh, qualified to untie his sandal. Um, so we have a pr prophecy in Isaiah 700 years before Christ of John the Baptist. And think of what oh, Zechariah is thinking at this time. Uh, Malachi talks about John the Baptist too. Malachi chapter 4 verse 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And of course, both of these scriptures are quoted in what uh, the angel is saying to Zacharias here, turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and such like as well as uh, preparing the way of the Lord. The job of John, the job of the, this messenger, this one who comes in the spirit and power and anointing of Ze uh, Elijah, is to announce the coming of the Lord, to prepare the way for the Messiah, to prepare hearts, and he did. People were coming from everywhere to John's ministry. He was, he was the, the, the popular preacher of the day. And he wasn't making a lot of enemies like Jesus did because he wasn't making any claims. Are you the Messiah? If he were said yes, they would have crucified him. But he wasn't. He said, no, I'm preparing the way. And I just like the, the poetry in there. He's bringing the mountains low and the valleys up so it's a smooth highway. It's easy to get saved. It's Jesus is going to make it easy to be right with God, to bring comfort to my people. And that's the job of John. And Jesus, you know, sang his praises to him. Oh, what did you go out to see in the wilderness? I tell you, he's a fulfillment of the prophecy about Elijah coming before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Verse 6 says, the, these people are both, what time is it getting to be? I have a few minutes here. The, these godly older people, both upright and blameless, and yet they have like the major affliction that the poor woman could have. In though that it was the understanding of the Jewish culture, and probably in a lot of cultures, that if you were barren, you were really a bad sinner. That you were cursed by God because everybody can have kids and you can't. There must be something wrong with you. And, but she, they weren't. They were righteous and upright, blameless. But yet, with a cloud hanging over her, he's ministering at the altar of incense in verse 9. The altar of incense represents prayer. Prayer is coming before the throne of God. The Lord is on the other side, the presence of the Lord in the temple situation, the tabernacle in the wilderness with uh, Moses. The Lord's presence is in the Holy of Holies, but just outside of it, the, the last stop 
is the altar of incense. How do you come to the Lord? Prayer. You come to the Lord through prayer, and that's what the altar of the incense represents. Prayer is a pleasant aroma coming up before God. And he says that several times, doesn't he, about prayers. Your prayers have come up to me as a sweet smelling incense. Um, and when Zechariah saw the angel, verse 12, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. I don't know, this kind of troubles me. That's not what he's thinking. He's, a, he's terrified. I mean, if you're just going about your business and all of a sudden an angel stands before you, hello, ah! Really, all we think, oh, it's a holy angel. Look how pretty they are. <laughs> no, they're terrifying. The yeah. first thing an angel says every time, yeah. fear not. Why? Because they're... Their, their knees are spiting together. They're, they're freaking out. Just hold, get a hold of yourself, man. I'm just an angel. <laughs> just an angel. <laughs> <laughs> people, I, I, I get a kick out of people, and I, I used to get grieved and angry. All these people, well, the Lord spoke to me about this and that, and you know, I had this vision, and they're in. This is, how can you're sleeping with your boyfriend and, and all that and you're just getting visions all the time and God's speaking and, and, and they're so glib and carefree and, and I'm thinking, no you aren't. When you, if you're hearing from God, you're terrified. Whether an angel comes or not, it's, it's still the presence of God. I remember the first time Becky and I were in a miracle meeting. We'd heard about it. We went to a Pentecostal church and we believed in healing and we prayed for the sick and nobody had respect anybody to get healed, but we did pray anyway. And, and then we went to a meeting where people were getting healed. I mean, really. And it was, they were, they were crying and saying, yeah, let's go. And, and I got scared. My first reaction to that was fear. I didn't say, oh, this is cool, just like in the days of Jesus, man. Yeah, I do that all the time. No, when God is really there, fear is upon you. If you were to have a, you know, and all the Lord spoke to me last night, and I know the Lord does speak to us, you know, but some people, the Lord speaks to them 20 times a day. I mean, the, whole, the Lord only gave Daniel a handful of visions in his whole life, and he was the holiest guy in the Bible. How did these people get off having 20 visions a day, you know? I, their definition of vision must be different. Either that or they have a familiar spirit. I don't know. Anyway, um, he was gripped with fear. Do not be afraid, Zacharias. Again, first thing, right? Do not be afraid, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you will call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he will be filled with his Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. John drank neither wine nor strong drink. He took no fruit of the vine. And when he came on the scene, he was dressed ruggedly, he was unshaven. And uh, basically, we're looking at somebody who had taken the vow of a Nazarite. And uh, I'm gonna close with just talking a little bit about the Nazarite. We lost a few minutes, so I don't think you mind taking an extra three or four here. In Numbers chapter 6. And of course, there's other Nazarites in the Bible too. Uh, Samson comes to mind immediately. Numbers 6, 1 through 8. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When either a man or a woman 
You don't, see, you don't see too many women with beards unshaven and stuff, but that's okay. When either a man or a woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of a Nazarite, they're offering themselves. It's you're consecrating an offering. Uh, you do have to give an offering too, but uh, as we'll read, to separate himself to the Lord. He shall separate himself from wine and similar drink. He shall drink neither vinegar made from wine nor vinegar made from similar drink. Neither shall he drink any grape juice nor eat fresh grapes or raisins. All the days of his separation he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine from seed to skin. All the days of his vow of his separation, no razor shall come upon his head until the days are fulfilled for which he had separated himself to the Lord. He shall be holy. Holy means set apart, totally set apart. And that's why uh, in the verse two it says, he shall separate himself to the Lord. And that's what the word holy means. It means set apart just for the Lord, not for anybody else, only for God. And the locks of it, he shall let the locks of his hair, of his head grow all the days that he separates himself to the Lord. He shall not go near a dead body. He shall not make himself unclean even for his father or his mother, for his brother or his sister when they die, because his separation to God is on his head. All the days of his separation, he shall be holy to the Lord. Samson missed that part about, you know, just... Uh, he killed everybody. He killed a lot of people, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and But that was under the anointing. God made it an exception there. But uh, it, the, you shall be holy. Uh, I mean, you're not just refraining from the grape. You're... you're refraining from even coming near the suggestion of sin, which death re represents. So it was a way that someone would separate himself temporarily for God, to spend quality time, kind of like we do when we're fasting. We're just gonna set ourselves aside for God. I remember one time, and we always say, we're going, oh, he set himself aside for fasting and prayer. But a lot of times when I fast, I carry about my normal duties. I just don't eat. But one week I decided I'm going to fast for seven days. And I spent the, the week in the church, in the church basement when we were on Rice Street. And uh, I'd come home at night and, and be with the family and everything. But uh, during the day, I'd be, I'd be at church, and I thought this was a, that was one of the most effective times. I didn't get any visions or anything, nothing, but it was a good time with the Lord. But so a Nazarite, he's avoiding any sign of pleasure. And that's what the grape represents, pleasure. Um, normally you'd take a vow for so many days to be a Nazarite, but uh, like Samson and John the Baptist, they were called to be Nazarites for their entire life. And basically, there's three uh, points on this. Number one, you cannot partake in wine, strong drink, or even grape juice. Uh, Judges chapter nine says, the vine said to them, shall I seize from my new wine, which cheers both God and men? That's the thing about wine, it cheers people. It, if you drink too much, you get into trouble. But initially it cheers you, it, it makes you happy. Uh, Psalm 104, wine makes glad the heart of man. When you say, I'm not gonna have the Nazarite vow number one, I'm going to swear off any joy except the joy of being with God. I need no additives for gladness and joy. I'm gonna find my gladness and joy in the Lord alone. And then number two, he doesn't cut his hair for the duration of the vow. In the days of the Bible, 
over long hair, and especially an unkempt appearance, or a shaved head, on the other hand, was a sign of shame. And so during this time, the Nazarite bore the shame of walking with God. Sometimes people shame you when you're walking with God. They make you, you know, they make you, you're a Jesus freak, you're an idiot, you're a nut. Jesus bore the shame of the cross and the Nazarite symbolically is bearing the shame of being set apart for God and not being understood by the world around him, just thought to be a little off his rocker, you know. Jesus freaks. Why would anybody do what you're doing? I know Jesus Freaks is a really old term now, but I think it's a good one. Mm -hmm. And so this, uh, it also represented the, the, law, the unkempt hair, it represented just looking different than everybody else either, just to, you know, I'm re retiring from society, and when I do cut my hair, then I'm coming back. And thirdly, he can touch no dead thing. Even his family, if they should die, immediate family. Um, death is not of God. Death is a result of sin. He who is set aside for God, whose holiness to the Lord shall never see death, but have life eternal. Praise God. So, shall we all become Nazarites? Amen. It's not a bad deal. It's not. I think the New Testament equivalent would be uh, an extended fast or something. Just a, I'm going to bow to the Lord for a few, uh, whatever and uh, just not eat for a period of time. Totally dedicate myself to the Lord. Amen.